Get Rich Education is brought to you by Ridge Lending Group, Apartment Investor Mastery, and Producers Wealth. You're listening to the show that has created more passive income for people than nearly any show in the world. This is the powerful Get Rich Education. Hey, you're inside GRE. From Bangalore, India to Bangor, Maine, and across 188 nations worldwide, this is Get Rich Education, episode 190. I'm Keith Weinhold. MacroWatch's Richard Duncan is going to be joining us shortly to discuss inflation and what that means to you as both a consumer and as a real estate investor. You know something? Back before I understood real estate investing, do you know what I would kind of silently think to myself, I thought, now how could investing in real estate be any good? Over the long term, its prices only keep up with inflation. Plus, it just seems like there would be a bunch of headaches to deal with. Well, then I understood leverage. When the leverage light bulb goes off, you learn that with an 80% loan and 20% down, you have just 5 x inflation. At 3% inflation, you've got a 15% gain. Then I learned that inflation also erodes away your mortgage debt at the same time. And next, you soon learn that your cash flow goes up faster than inflation since your biggest monthly payment, your P&I, stays fixed for up to 30 years. Yeah, but what about the interest that's paid on the loan? Oh, the tenant pays your debt service in a cash flowing property. They pay all of the interest for you. Oh, and then there's more. They also pay down your loan for you. And then you get even more because on top of all that, they even pay you something extra yet called cash flow. And pretty soon, real estate investing begins to make a ton of sense. And that's even before you understand all of the tax benefits. Well, now, recently, I just happened to notice that my local coffee shop a few blocks away from me they raised the price on my favorite coffee drink from $3.79 up to $4.29, and that's a sign of inflation. Recently, my wife brought home some brown cow brand yogurt containers and put them into the fridge. I know that just a few months ago, that yogurt was served in six-ounce containers. I just happened to notice stuff like that. Now, today in the fridge, I saw that the containers are only 5.3 ounces each at the same price. That's inflation. It now costs more per ounce. Southwest Airlines raised alcoholic drink prices from $5 up to $6 and $7. That's inflation, the diminished purchasing power of your dollar again. So just like me, you've been seeing this consumer price inflation all of your life. You've just become accustomed to it. Now, there's also asset inflation, different from consumer inflation, where you're paying more for a share of Facebook stock today than you did a few years ago and more for an income property today than you did a few years ago as well. Now, there are some deflationary forces out there as well, most notably technology and the ever-increasing ability for you to pay lower wages to overseas freelancers, for example. But the general long-term trend is inflation and bouts of deflation are pretty rare. In fact, today your dollar is worth just one thirtieth of what it was 100 years ago. Well, with that in mind, let's say that you are in debt to a friend. You owe a friend some money and there's no interest on the loan, and you owe that friend $10,000. Well, with inflation in mind, would you want to pay back that friend the 10000 bucks today, or would you rather pay them back five years from now? Well, of course, you would rather pay back your friend in five years, because in five years, you'd still give them the $10,000, but its purchasing power then might be eroded to, say, $8,500. And right there, you have just profited through the process of borrowing. For my first ever Forbes article, which I wrote just about six months ago, my article was titled, How You Can Profit from Inflation. It was about how inflation makes your debt dissolve right before your eyes. 
much like that simple example that I just gave you. Now, this effect matters more to real estate investors than it does to everyday laypersons because we tie up debt at scale while others don't. Now, I've discussed this before, but I'll just give you another example as to why you would want inflation and why you would probably welcome a higher rate of inflation. On your $1 million property, if you've got a $750,000 loan on it, 5% inflation means that you will get a nice $37,500 phantom loan paydown just in that one year. Your prosperity just increased by $37,500. And most investors that benefit from this inflation profiting, they are not even aware that this is happening. And notice that I'm not forgetting about a mortgage interest rate that's paid because in a cash flowing property, again, your tenant pays the mortgage interest plus the principal plus a little extra to you every month that's called cash flow. And of course, it gets even better. More inflation also increases the dollar denominated value of your property whose benefits are again magnified the more that you're leveraged. Now, do you think that more money printing equals more inflation? Well, I used to think that the answer to that question was yes. In fact, classically, more dollars in circulation was actually the definition of inflation. But as you're going to find out today, all of that has changed. Well, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that today inflation is only about 2%. I don't know if you're willing to believe it's really that low. Well, is inflation expected to spike higher or go lower? And why? And where does money come from anyway? And what's going to happen with interest rates? Well, all those questions are what today's guest and I are going to talk about. He's one of the world's great macroeconomists and the publisher of the MacroWatch video newsletter. And that is a really good place to do some valuable learning. And it's really big brained stuff that Richard delivers for you over there. He is here to inform you and teach you, not entertain you with a bunch of motorcycles jumping off ramps in the background or something. MacroWatch doesn't play the Lemon Remix with Drake and Rihanna in it, okay? Richard is a great source for learning about monetary policy and how it affects you. And you know what I want to tell you about macroeconomics and what we're discussing today? Okay, these are large national and global forces that you cannot do anything about. You can't control the direction of the prime rate or mortgage interest rates or inflation or the gold and silver price or even single family home prices in your city. In investing, you know, really there are things out there that you can control and there are other things that you cannot control. Well, where's your value in learning about things that you cannot even control? Well, there's a lot because you can respond based on where you think that the direction of policy is moving. And people are looking at this stuff all the time in order to predict long-term trends. You've got to have a self-interest in not just what you can control, but also what you can't control. I mean, just look at the path of a hurricane. You can't control that hurricane's course one bit, but you want to follow where it's going because you might have to board up some windows and evacuate. So yeah, it is worth paying a lot of attention to big things that you can't control as well as those things that you can. We're talking with one of the world's great macroeconomists about things that we both can control and can't control, joining us from Thailand right after this. MC Lobsher is the host of the top-rated business and investing podcast, Cashflow Ninja, and also the president of Producers Wealth. Producers Wealth assists people in creating, protecting, and perpetually multiplying wealth in any economy through creating processes that help them increase their production, provide them with liquidity, passive income generators, and opportunities for enormous growth. Learn more about their time-tested and proven systems at yourownbankingsystem.com. For an income property investor like you that needs an income property loan, go to Ridge Lending Group. And over the years, you've heard owner Chaley Ridge generously give her time to you right here on the show as a guest. 
RIDS provides investment property loans in almost every U.S. state, and you're going to find out how they've helped more Americans realize their dreams of financial freedom through real estate than any other mortgage lender in the entire nation when you get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Hey, everybody, this is Matt Bowles from Maverick Investor Group. You're listening to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, and don't quit your daydream. Today's guest is the author of three books on the global economic crisis, including the international bestseller called The Dollar Crisis. And that book accurately forecasts the global economic crisis of 2008 with some pretty extraordinary accuracy. He began his career as an equities analyst in Hong Kong in 1986. He was the global head of investment strategy for a company in London. He was a financial sector specialist for the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and he's headed equity research departments in Bangkok. He also worked as a consultant for the IMF in Thailand during the Asia crisis, and he's now the publisher of the pretty well-known video newsletter, MacroWatch, which can be found on his website, richardduncaneconomics.com. I've learned a fair bit from MacroWatch myself. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, Richard Duncan. Thank you, Keith. It's great to be back. Thank you for inviting me. Richard, I think most people know what inflation is, but they just don't really know that much about it or where it comes from or what pushes it around. Inflation, I kind of think of it as the rate at which the dollar's purchasing power is diluted. And I think of some inflation as being good because in deflation, people hoard dollars. And in deflation, people hoard dollars because dollars are going to be worth more tomorrow and when dollars are worth more tomorrow, well, that means consumers don't spend and businesses don't profit. What are your thoughts? Well, that's right. Uh, too much inflation is not good and too much deflation is not good either. It's best to have relative price stability. The Fed's target for inflation, they would like to see 2% inflation a year. They think that's ideal. And that's what they, they aim to achieve. But yes, I mean, if prices move up too rapidly, then if you have high rates of inflation, as we did in the 1970s, then that harms savers. People have cash saved in the bank. Elderly people, for instance, who are not financially sophisticated. Their cash essentially evaporates at the rate of the inflation. On the other hand, deflation is also bad because if prices start falling 5% a year, then that means it's harder for everyone to earn enough money to repay the debts that they've borrowed in the past because their income is dropping, but their debts remain the same. So both high rates of inflation and deflation are harmful to the economy and to different sets of individuals. Now, inflation is certainly bad for savers. In the opposite way, I favor carrying long-term fixed interest rate debt tied to a cash flowing asset and losing leverage. It, you know, I'm effectively kind of a cheerleader of inflation because just like inflation erodes the purchasing power of a saver's lump of savings in a bank account, inflation erodes the weight of our debt over time in the opposite way. It's just one of many reasons that I'm an inflation cheerleader. And I just think a lot of people don't think about inflation as much as they should. For example, if someone owns a $500,000 piece of property and that property appreciates to $525,000 after one year's time, People say, well, it went up in value, it appreciated 5%. Well, kind of. We don't really know how much of that was due to appreciation and value creation and how much of that $25,000 gain, that 5% gain, was inflation. It might have been 4% inflation and 1% appreciation. So inflation has long been present. What really is wrong with high inflation, Richard, other than the fact that it's bad for savers? What would be wrong with high inflation as long as wages and prices matched that same high inflation rate? Well, I take your point, but the inflation rate has been so low for so long, and therefore interest rates have been low because interest rates and inflation rate move together. That You could say the, largely the inflation rate determines the interest rate to a very large extent. Well, we had such low interest rates for so long that asset prices have moved to a very high level as a result of the very, very low interest rates. Now, if we were to see a return of the double-digit inflation that we saw in the 1970s, 
then that means that interest rates would also go back into the double digits. And that would crash the stock market and destroy literally tens of trillions of dollars of wealth. And so with that much wealth evaporation from the stock market, people would simply have far less money to be able to buy real estate. And so that's the problem. Now, 10 years ago, quantitative easing launched. We talked about that a bit when you were last year on the show a couple months ago, and that created a big surge in the money supply. Quantitative easing started in 2008. It ended in 2014. And you know, a lot of people predicted that that surge in the money supply, well, that meant there was going to be high inflation because there were going to be so many dollars out there flooding the economy that the value of each individual dollar was going to be worth less. And right there, we've got inflation, but it didn't happen. We never got high inflation despite all this massive money printing from 2008 to 2014. Tell us why. Well, it's a long story, but the main reason why, well, first, let me say that Milton Friedman, the famous monetary economist, he was very famous for saying that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And by that, what he meant is if the money supply increased rapidly, then inflation would increase rapidly as well. The money supply growth caused the inflation. Well, it's true that money supply does sometimes cause inflation. But really, I've just finished a, a study of inflation over the last 100 years and what's caused it. And inflation is not always a monetary phenomenon. Inflation is also caused by demand shocks and supply shocks. And for instance, there can be inflationary demand shocks. For instance, when we have had wars, that's caused inflation. The government spent more money and that pushed up prices. That was an inflationary demand shock. Right. But there's also deflationary demand shocks. For instance, when the war ends and the government spends less money, that's a deflationary demand shock. Or when a bubble pops, like the bubble of 2008, when it popped, people had less money, and so they spent less, and that caused them prices to fall. And similarly, there are supply shocks, both inflationary and deflationary. An example of an inflationary supply shock was the two oil shocks during the 1970s. The Arab oil embargo and the Iraq-Iran war caused a shortage of oil, and that was an inflationary supply shock. But what we've seen and what's been most important in recent decades is globalization, whereby the United States buys an increasing amount of goods every year from ultra low wage countries, that has been a deflationary supply shock. Let me explain. Up until 1980, the US did not have a trade deficit at all. Trade was balanced and it had to be balanced under the Bretton Woods system and under the gold standard, trade had to balance. If a country had a trade deficit, they had to pay for that deficit with their gold, and they would quickly run out of gold and stop buying things from other countries, and trade would come back into balance. But after 1980, just a decade after the Bretton Woods system collapsed, the United States started running very, very large trade deficits. They peaked at $800 billion, or 6% of U.S. GDP, in 2006. Now, what this meant was the U.S. no longer had to worry about domestic capacity constraints. If the government spent too much money in the 1960s and 1970s, then that very quickly led to full employment and full capacity utilization and high rates of inflation. We had a domestic economy, and if the government spent too much, that drove up prices and wages. But now, after we started running these massive trade deficits, the U.S. is not only, we're not just looking at a labor pool of 100 million Americans or so making goods for the U.S. economy. Now we have a labor pool that numbers in the billions. And the truth is there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who would be happy to work for $5 a day. So this has been a radical deflationary supply shock. It's a deflationary labor supply shock. Suddenly, there are billions of people supplying goods for the U.S. market at very low wages. And this has been the dominant factor now going back to the 1980s as to why there's been no inflation in the United States. So inflation started coming down in the 80s, it got lower in the 90s and continued to get lower in the 2000s. 
Then we had our crisis in 2008. And just to demonstrate how important these deflationary forces of globalization are, after the crisis started, the Fed increased the money supply by 109% in 2009, and then another 34% in 2011. That's astounding. And another 39% in 2013. Now, to put that into perspective, even during World War II, the money supply only increased at the most by about 29%, and that caused very high rates of inflation immediately after the war, and the price controls came off. Well, this time, the money supply growth has been multiples of what it was during the war and in three rounds of it. And still, there's been no inflation. Why? Because globalization drives down wages and in prices and inflation. And also, when the bubble popped, then there was a deflationary demand shock. People had less money as well, and so prices fell. And so it's very important to understand the forces that drive the global economy and how they keep evolving. Things change, and, and the biggest change in our lifetime is this shift to globalization, the biggest economic change. The breakdown of the Bretton Woods system suddenly meant that the economic policies that were considered orthodox in the past, those were essentially thrown out the window. Before the Bretton Woods system broke down, central banks weren't free to print as much money as they pleased. They couldn't print a lot of money. And trade had to balance, and currencies were pegged. Well, once the Bretton Woods system broke down, suddenly the currencies were no longer pegged to anything. They floated up and down against each other, and central banks were free to print as much money as they wanted, and trade no longer had to balance. And this radically changed the, the way that the global economy works, and the economics profession still hasn't grasped the importance of these changes that have resulted from the U.S. running massive trade deficits. It has radically changed everything. And if you understand how these changes have occurred and the impact that they have, then it becomes much easier to anticipate what the government is likely to do next in terms of monetary policy and how those policies are going to impact interest rates, property prices, the stock market, currencies, commodities, gold, etc. So that's what I focus on in my work, economics in the age of paper money. Quantitative easing really exposed as a myth that the money supply determines the inflation rate. I think quantitative easing showed us that the money supply no longer determines the inflation rate. And yeah, globalization is going to be with us in you know, the internet and the proliferation of cloud computing, that really just accelerated globalization. You know, for example, me, sometimes I need some graphic design work done. Well, I don't even think about hiring someone in my own hometown and paying $40 an hour for them when I can go on these virtual assistant websites and get someone in Bangladesh to do it for $10 an hour. That right there is deflationary. Technology is deflationary. The sharing economy is deflationary. There's so many deflationary forces out there. But tell me what you think. We're destroying dollars. We've begun a cycle of quantitative tightening. So what's going to happen? That's right. Uh, the Fed printed $3.5 trillion after the crisis. Its total assets increased from roughly $900 billion in 2007 to four and a half trillion dollars because it printed money and bought government bonds and pushed up bond prices and pushed down interest rates. Now they're doing the opposite. They are reversing quantitative easing. They are doing quantitative tightening, which is literally destroying money. And that should push interest rates higher. But in terms of the thing that worries me most about inflation itself is the possibility that globalization is now going to be reversed through trade wars. Just what we've seen in, in recent weeks and months is growing trade war between the United States and China. First, steel tariffs. The U.S. imposed steel tariffs and then announced that it was going to put tariffs on up to $60 billion of Chinese products, 25% tariffs. And China retaliated by putting 25% tariffs on 180 
product categories of things that the United States sells into China. Now, so this is going to reverse globalization if it continues. And as we just discussed, the only reason that the high rates of money supply growth that we've had over the last 10 years, normally that would have caused hyperinflation, but it didn't. We've had no inflation for decades because globalization has been pushing prices down. But now if we have a trade war and globalization reverses, then this is going to, com again, completely restructure the global economy. We'll be back into a much more inflationary environment, much more like what we saw in the 1970s. For instance, in the 1960s and 1970s, when President Johnson and President Nixon spent too much money on the Vietnam War and the Great Society programs domestically in the United States, that overstimulated the U.S. economy. And because we didn't have trade deficits at that point, we weren't buying things from low-wage countries, that led to inflation. But when afterwards Paul Volcker crushed the inflation with extremely high rates of inflation and a very severe recession in the early 80s, but then immediately after that, President Reagan started spending even more money than President Johnson or, or Nixon. He had much larger government budget deficits than the earlier presidents had, but this didn't cause inflation. Why not? Because by the 1980s, we had started buying things from abroad and started running very large trade deficits. And so we were able to have very aggressive fiscal stimulus under President Reagan without having the inflation. Now we're back in a situation where we're running very large budget deficits again. Budget deficits are going to be a trillion dollars a year for the next three years. Well, that will probably be okay as long as globalization continues. But if you reverse globalization, then we're going to have very high inflationary pressures again, just as we did in the late 60s and 70s. Yeah, it's very interesting to see who continues to get the upper hand at this tug of war. Is it inflation or is it deflation? But, you know, Richard, really, what can an individual investor do? Because an individual investor themselves, they can't control these powerful forces of governments and central banks. So really, the best thing for an investor to do is just sort of get themselves parallel and do what these policymakers are doing. What can an individual investor do to respond to what might happen? There are different kinds of investors, some with enormous amounts of money to invest and others with very little amounts of money. But for your audience, somewhere in the middle, I would imagine, first of all, my advice would be have a business of your own that is going to survive hard times or prosper in good times. So, you know, <laughs> don't stop working, in other words. Have a, a business that you can control and that will generate cash flow for you through good times and bad. And also, I, I am a believer in owning real estate, owning property for rental purposes. And when I say real estate, I mean land with a house on top of it, not condos. There's no limit as to how many condos can be built in the world, but there is a limit as to how much land there is in the world. And if we have inflationary pressures, then okay, gold prices will go up, but land prices will also go up for the same reason. And if we have a depression, all right, then gold prices would go down and land prices would go down. But still, the difference between gold and land, and the reason I prefer land with houses, is because you can build a house on your piece of land and you can rent it out and have cash flow income from your rental income. So I believe that having a, as many rental homes as possible is on pieces of land is a very good investment strategy for normal investors. Of course, it's even more attractive since interest rates are so low and since you can lock them in for 15 or even 30 years at low interest rates. Other countries, it's not possible to lock in interest rates for so long at a fixed rate. But of course, you can't take on so much mortgage that in the case of a severe economic downturn, which can't be ruled out, you don't want to have so much debt. You have to be prepared for a drop in your rental income and not have so much leverage that you'll be wiped out if we do have a severe economic crisis and your rents fall significantly. So you have to strike the right balance between cash and leverage. In good times and in bad times, people are gonna need housing. That housing is going to be on a piece of land and people need to eat food. Sometimes we talk about agricultural real estate investing here too. With gold, you can't live in it and you can't eat it, that's for sure. 
So we talk about things that have had real value to humans over time and have utility. So Richard Duncan, you've got a great resource out there called Macro Watch. And if you're interested in forecasting economics and trends and inflation and the direction of interest rates and macro monetary policy things, I don't know of a better resource than Macro Watch. Tell us about that, Richard. Well, that's right. So I think that as our discussion points to, the economy just doesn't work in the same way that it did in the past. Back before the Bretton Woods system broke down, money was effectively backed by gold. And when that stopped being the case, everything changed. Suddenly, central banks were free to print as much money as they wanted. Trade between countries no longer balanced. Currencies floated up and down. This completely changed the way economics function and the way they impact financial markets. It changed the policy options open to the government and how the government attempts to control the economy. And this impacts interest rates and the stocks and property and commodities and currency prices. So in my work, what I do is I publish a video newsletter called Macro Watch. And in Macro Watch, every couple of weeks, I upload a new video, which is essentially me making a PowerPoint presentation describing something important going on in the global economy and how that's likely to impact all of the financial markets. And so I would encourage your listeners to visit my website, richardduncaneconomics.com, and sign up for my free blog and see what the work that I'm doing. And I'd like to offer your listeners a discount to subscribe to MacroWatch. Normally, MacroWatch costs $500 a year, but if your listeners would visit richardduncaneconomics.com and hit the subscribe button, if they use the discount coupon code GRE, that's GRE, then they can subscribe for $250 a year. And if they do, then they will have immediate access to 42 hours of macro watch videos in the archives, which really, I think, fundamentally explain how the economy works in the 21st century. And also, they will receive one new video every two weeks or so for the next year. So I encourage them to take a look at richardduncaneconomics.com. Richard Duncan, thank you for the offer. It's been great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Keith. It's always a pleasure. In summary, we currently have inflation, although it is still low. Tariffs threaten to reverse globalization. That would create higher inflation. More dollars don't equal inflation any longer, as counterintuitive as that sounds. Higher interest rates, which we are experiencing now, correlate with higher inflation, which Richard discussed with us the last time that he was here six weeks ago. And, you know, I've got one more powerful example for you here. Look, if you save a million bucks in the bank in basically a zero yield savings account at a 4% inflation rate after 30 years, your purchasing power will be eroded down to just $308,000 from that original million. Ouch. But of course, oppositely, for every million bucks you borrow in that situation instead, now your million bucks in debt gets eroded down to just $308,000. Pretty nice kicker for being financially educated and taking action. By the way, I'll put that inflation calculator in the show notes for how I came up with those figures. I wrote about that in the GetRichEducation.com blog and was asked by a few people about just how I arrived at those numbers over there. Next week, we're going to discuss how fourplex buildings occupy a special space in the real estate investment world and just how you can maximize your profitability with a fourplex to make sure that you get every episode of Get Rich Education delivered to you without any junk mail or other stuff included, it is pretty easy. On your podcast platform, be sure to tap the subscribe button and that way you'll be sure that you don't ever miss any wealth building episode by hitting subscribe. Until next week, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. 
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. If you want to retire in five years or less through real estate investing, then pay close attention as I'm about to share my proven recipe with you. This is Brad Sumrock, and I've taught thousands of people just like you how to replace their incomes, quit their jobs, or simply have more income and freedom than they ever thought possible. And we do this by investing in apartment buildings. After starting with no experience, I managed to pocket over a million dollars in cash and retire from my 17-year corporate job after only three years of apartment investing. And I have hundreds of successful students that have had similar results. If you want to get out of the rat race or simply have more income and freedom in your life, then investing in apartment buildings might be the answer for you. Visit our website at bradsumrock.com to get more information about our upcoming training events. That's B-R-A-D-S-U-M-R-O-K dot com. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.